Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. The church must be prepared to receive and disciple the many people who are awakening to the truth of Jesus. What will the harvest be like and how can we get ready? For over 25 years, Pamela Christian has been helping people in matters of faith. She compassionately wants people to confidently discover and live in life-giving truth. Her ministry experience began as a teaching director for our Community Bible Study, an independent interdenominational international organization. This led to her receiving invitations to speak at various retreats and conferences, followed by her work as a radio talk show host in two major markets. Her first publications were as contributing writer to various books and magazines. With her experience and certificate in apologetics from Biola University, Pam's passion continues to be expressed as, bo as a book author and media personality. In 2018, she was awarded an honorary Doctor of Divinity from HBA, HSBN International School of Ministry. Here to discuss her new book, Prepare for the Harvest, God's Challenge to the Church Today, is Pamela Christian. Pamela, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, we're glad to see you and glad that uh, we were able to uh, finally connect with you. It uh, was... Uh, I believe almost two years ago when we first started this pursuit to get you on board and now you've released the fifth in the Prepare, Prepare for the Harvest series that uh, has kind of moved us in a contemporary way to uh, tracking uh, what's almost an ancient message mm -hmm. uh, since Messiah ascended to heaven. Everybody's been preparing for the harvest and that's been the message, but things have changed and not everything has lined up as people would like for the preparation for his return. But we're starting to see a lot of different signs and wonders which tell us that we're getting close. Not that we're time setters, not that we're looking to say that uh, this is imminent, but we do know that the Bible tells us it's going to happen and Israel certainly plays a big part in that. Let's go back before we get into the whole concept of preparing for the harvest and uh, this new message of God's challenge to the church today and get to know Pamela Christian a little bit better in your faith journey, where it all began, mom and dad, home, when faith became your own, what was that watershed moment for you? All right, well, I'm probably very normal in terms of being raised in a home that was not Christian. My parents were very contemporary of the day. We're talking about the 60s. Um, they didn't want to influence me, but rather wanted me to find my own way, which is the wrong way to parent a child, in my opinion. But I ended up doing what I would do in that situation. I lived according to the world. And I knew about Jesus because occasionally an aunt or a neighbor would take my sister and I to church, and I'd learned about Jesus from the Sunday school teacher. So I knew about Jesus. And about uh, oh, just a few weeks short of turning 30 years old, having made a complete mess of my life more than once, I called out to God with sheer abandon. I really didn't even know how to address him because I didn't know him that well. I only, as I said, knew about Jesus. And I recall saying something like, God, if you are everything people say you are, if you can take my life and make something good out of it, especially since I've only proven all I can do is make a mess out of it, then I want to surrender my life to you. I want you to be Lord of my life. I confessed that I knew him as Lord that could keep me from heaven or from hell. Uh, I was looking to him more like an insurance policy to keep me from hell. But I admitted at that point uh, in sheer brokenness that I wanted him to be Lord of my life. And with all sincerity and all abandon, saying those words, I sensed an, a change in me immediately, a transformation. I came to understand it to be a transformation. And my life has not been the same since. It's been uh, filled with all the problems that life has, but I have a hope and a future that I didn't have otherwise. It's um, a glorious transformation. And I never, ever want to go back to anything similar to my old life. Well, I think uh, all of us who uh, have an honest assessment of who we were before Messiah, if we've really had that transformational encounter and come face to face with ourselves and with the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, then you can never go back. Uh, it, to me, it's just not even a possibility that, 
that uh, you died to self and God has restored you to a new creation, as Paul writes about in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Right. Uh, you started on this quest, uh, prepare for the harvest. And so when you, this is the fifth in the series. What prompted you to grab a hold of this statement in the Bible that says that the uh, fields are, are white, uh, the, the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. That's the watchword behind this prepare for the harvest. What stimulated that? What was the driving force behind that? And how has it taken on through the last four iterations uh, a life of its own that you are continuing to to go down that path? Oh, it's an interesting question because I never ever sought out to do any of the things that the Lord's had me do. You mentioned that I was a community Bible study teacher. I never set out to do that. Uh, I never set out to be on radio. I never set out to be an author. That was probably the thing I resisted the most. <laughs> but what happened was I read an article by ABC News and it was titled, Americans are surprisingly flexible about matters of religious faith. And I thought oh, I would probably read the article and learn that there are people in our country from all sorts of religions, and we we're okay with that as Americans, but that's not what I read. Instead, I read that there were people in positions of influence, highly educated people, who were taking tenets of different religious beliefs and combining them to make a religion of their quote-unquote own preference. And reading this, I became outraged. I was just so angry, and at the same time, my heart broke because I realized these are people of influence who are influencing other people on this road of deception. Mm. And then as I gave it more thought, I realized that people who are deceived are unaware of their condition. That's the nature of deception. So how much more important is it for those of us who have the truth to share the truth we have? It would be the most loving thing for us to do to share the truth. To not share the truth would be far from loving because that's only allowing them to go to hell. And I've said before, we've got generations of people who are going to hell in a handbasket that's been woven by the church because the church has not been as effective in our culture as it should be, as we are commanded to be. So I sat down, Rabbi, to write what I thought was going to be an op-ed piece. And you should have seen my fingers flying on that keyboard. I was so angry. And as I was writing it, I, I heard the Lord say, it's going to be a book. I said, okay, Lord, it's going to be a book. And I continued writing. As I was then writing the book, he said, it's going to be more than one book. So the series itself is actually called Faith to Live By. And the first three books are more about applied Christian faith. Then there came a time where the Lord had me consider all this prophecy about a billion soul harvest. And looking as I was looking out at the culture of the church in general, I'm, I'm painting with a broad brush here, my conclusion was the church isn't ready. If even 10, 20 people sh knew showed up at the doorway of most churches, they would not be equipped to properly welcome and disciple them. And that began me thinking about the harvest and the end times. So the first book on this topic is called Prepare for the Harvest, Confidence in God's Promises, Confidence in God's End Time Promises. So I never thought about eschatology. In fact, my daughter, when I re mentioned it to her, she heard exitology. <laughs> I thought that's just exactly what a lot of Christians think. They're just waiting for a rapture that the Bible doesn't even discuss to be taken out of here. And they're living their lives very uh, privately. Uh, they've got their own and they're just protecting their own. And it's, it's a travesty. It breaks my heart. So I wrote the first book, uh, Confidence in God's End Time Promises. And then as I continued to think about these things, not of my own election, but the Lord inspiring me, I, I realized that the church needed to have some practical uh, wisdom as to what we can do to be prepared. We're supposed to be prepared at any moment, always. As you had said that this, this imminent return of Christ is unknown. We don't know the day or the hour, but we're to be prepared at all times. You know, that's the message of Matthew 25 is the parable of the, the ten virgins and, and uh, the five that were ready and had the oil and the five that didn't. And uh, it's, it's always been a message of be, be ready, be prepared. But people don't really know what they're being charged because there's so many conflicting doctrinal and theological statements out there. You mentioned one of them, which is to me as a Jew... Uh, and a Jewish believer, uh, the price I had to pay in order to come to faith 
at age mm -hmm. 44 out of the Orthodox synagogue. In order to say yes to Jesus, I had to say no to 14 million relatives. Mm -hmm. I had to be able to stand up to the rejection, the disownment, the hatred, the rejection of my own state of Israel to say that because you've made a public profession of faith in Jesus, we're not going to allow you citizenship in Israel, even though your family came out of the Holocaust, even though there's Holocaust survivors in your family, even though you are bloodline, mother, father, all the way through grandparents, all the way back. Uh, because of one statement, uh, you are going to forfeit that right. Uh, most Christians, most Gentiles have no idea of what it means to count the cost. And they don't really understand that it's almost as if there's a dual salvation theology out there. Mm -hmm. uh, accept Jesus and you get eternal life, but wait, there's more. If you accept Jesus, you're also going to avoid the coming trouble. And that's not what the Bible says. The no. Bible makes no reference. As a matter of fact, he says, if you follow me, there will be tribulation. And you can pick and choose passages of scripture. They're going to tell you that you're going to be taken out of here. and that, that. But I did not accept Messiah and give up all that I had to be willing to give up just so that I could go somewhere to wait out until it was safe for me to return. Uh, that's separation from him. I am to never be separate from him from the moment of my profession of faith until ever. Right. It is an eternal decision. I shall never be separated from him. Not here, not there, not anywhere. And I don't think people grasp the significance of this. This is not a check in to the heaven hotel while everything else plays out on earth. It's you're in. You're, you're in for the whole rest of the story. And uh, I'm a, a strong believer in that. And so um, doctrine is not something, church doctrine is not something that I ever delve into because that's 28,000 different opinions. <laughs> you know, how do you, how do you get 28,000 people in a room all arguing with each other as to whether a woman can speak or whether or not uh, you can wear pants or whether or not you can, uh, if, if prophecy is for today. There's so many disagreements. There's so much division. And the most essential and important thing is the faith in Jesus. And that should be unifying. And yet it's so dividing. Once you get one step past that, it's total division. There is no unity within the body. And I think that this is an abomination to God and it's an anathema to the believer that we should see this kind of division. And you talk about that because what you've done with this new book is you started out by evaluating the culture. Mm -hmm. Give us your view of the culture today, a synopsis of what we're looking at in, from a cultural, global, and it's not just the Western church. There is a global change, a global shift mm -hmm. in what's being taught, what's being said, and the personal walk that people are making with the Messiah. Yes, as I was doing my research for the books, and again, I never thought I would be an author, so this is interesting that we're up to book five. And by the way, there is a book six that's planned. <laughs> but as I was doing the research, uh, it took me back to the 18th century period of enlightenment. There was a French and a German Enlightenment, and that's basically where revelation was replaced by human knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that was, to me, that's my opinion, that that was the beginning of the secularization of the world in which we live. Um, once you no longer have need for divine revelation, and it's all up to human rationale, we're on a very uh, dastardly slope, for sure. So... Um, if you will look at that and, and realizing that that was at the 18th century and the, the significant players that were part of that, bringing it clear through today to our colleges and universities and many on the American soil uh, actually uh, provide instruction for students from all over the world. So this is one way we're getting a global common thread. 
uh, we have instead of inductive instruction, we have deductive instruction that's being given mostly, not all teachers, every teacher uh, is different. I'm, I am painting with a broad brush, so I, I want to qualify that. But we do have a great deal of our population, our younger generations who have been taught using deductive, and they, they have no grid, no ability to properly use ration and logic to reason for themselves. Um, so they've been told what to believe instead of how to think. And this is part of why we have such a divide. The younger generations especially, and I'm getting into that with the sixth book, the younger generations, which is after the millennials in my opinion, um, and they have different names, so we'll just say after the millennials, um, they have no regard for the Bible, they have no regard for Jesus, they think the church is irrelevant, uh, they think people who believe in Jesus are out to lunch, they, that we have absolutely no ability to think for ourselves when in reality it's the opposite. Um, yet, they are created in God's image. Every one of us are created in God's image. And God puts within us certain desires so that we will discover Him. And one question that the Lord had me stumble upon is this, Rabbi, who in this room wants to live your life on the basis of a lie? No one ever raises their hand to that question. So that opens the door for me to then explain, okay, since no one raises their hand, that means universally, worldwide, we all prefer truth over deception or lies. Right. And if we all prefer truth over deception or lies, and that means we have the ability to choose that truth is good and lies or deception is bad. And if we universally have that ability to recognize truth is good and lies are bad, that means we universally have a moral compass. Now, where did the morality come from? And so this opens the door for me to talk to people who really would reject the Bible or Jesus if I were to lead with that. What I've learned to do and what I'm trying to help other people do is to lead with the, the uh, felt needs, the human felt needs that we have in common. We all want to belong. We all want to be loved. We all want to have, make something significant out of our lives. And, and when I'm talking to people from other generations, when I'm trying to get in to have a dialogue with them, one of the questions I also ask is, why would you have any sense of feeling insignificant unless you were created to be significant? So these kinds of questions bypass the institutions that the younger generations reject and gives us an opportunity to have relationship first. First and foremost, we must have relationship, uh, but then have opportunity to bring people to the truth that we all want to discover. Since you put it out there, let's follow this track a little bit. Mom and dad go to church on Sunday. Little Johnny, little Sally have never seen mom and dad read a Bible at home. Little Johnny and little Sally have never heard their mom and dad praying together. Little Johnny and little Sally get told these Bible lessons by a youth pastor and by the youth program at their church and Mom and Daddy never asked them a question about, what did you learn today? What did you hear today? And little Johnny and little Sally never asked Mom and Dad, what did you learn? What did you hear today? They then take the next social step after church and they go meet up with their friends at a local restaurant. Do they really talk about the message? Do they really, or do they have uh, their favorite meal on Sunday lunch fried pastor and they gossip or they belittle or they don't talk about church at all and it's no longer train up a child in the way they should go it's no longer setting the example of ministry begins at home how has this COVID-19 shelter at home impacted and we we don't know because we haven't surveyed we have not said uh, what we have noticed is is that uh, Walmart is selling out of Bibles that we do know and so Bibles are flying off the shelf what's happening to them are people is this the setup for the Great Awakening or is this a setup for um, the I can't go get the COVID-19 vaccine 
so I'm going to use God as my vaccine while I'm in need, and then I'm going to put them back on the shelf like a medication that I only take when I have a flare-up. Am I going to put them back in the drawer, and by the time I pull it out, fortunately there is no expiration date on the Bible like there is on the medication that I haven't had to take for two years because the inflammation wasn't there. Where's really the core of the issue? Where's really the decline in biblical literacy? Where's the decline in raising up a generation that has no regard for relevancy of the church? Because they've never seen mom and dad exemplify anything that they were told that are the fruit of a believer. Mm -hmm. They haven't seen it exhibited in the home. Mm -hmm. What's COVID-19 doing? Well, like prophecy, we won't know uh, the fulfillment of it until it actually occurs. So anything I share at this point is conjecture, uh, prayerful conjecture. Um, I see COVID-19 as a wake-up call from God to the people worldwide. You know, I was just thinking this morning, Rabbi, this to me, because this is worldwide, and that's mind-boggling that we are sheltering in place worldwide. So it's not one government that's trying to make an oppression here, at least not a natural government that's trying to create this oppression. And it led me to think, wow. You know, I, when I read the contents of the book of Revelation or any of the other scriptures that talk about the end times, uh, I, I often think, how could that happen? How could that many people be led that far astray? How could that many people be willing to uh, worship the beast? I mean, it's, it's hard for me to get my mind around. But as we are living in this worldwide pandemic and we're seeing how controlled we are being, how submissive we are being, it gives us a taste of what could happen in the future. And I believe that God is taking this time right now as a, a form of discipline, frankly, on his people. As we read in the Old Testament, and you're better versed at this than I am, God allows his people to be given over to their own desires for a period of time until their life gets so bad they finally cry out to him. As Second Chronicles 7, 13 and 14 is what we should be aware of because scripture 13 talks about pestilence. And we have certainly been dealing with that but God says, if my people will humble themselves and call upon me, I will hear them and I will heal their land. This is what's needed right now. I believe this time uh, is causing us with great reflection. You said Bibles are going off the shelf. Churches that are conducting their services via the Internet are seeing great numbers of people in attendance online. Will this be like 9-11, which is what you were alluding to? Will this be short-lived in terms of our response? I pray not. I pray not. And my role, my call, is to be someone who calls people to come up higher, to take this seriously. I am also a survivor of sudden cardiac arrest. I actually died and was revived. So I have an experiential reality of the existence of heaven and the existence of God. And I know more than most how very, very important it is that we see the signs of the times, we respond with the truth that Jesus came to give us. You know, if we do not respond to the truth and the victory that Christ died to give us, we are making a mockery of what Jesus has done. So these are serious times, and I pray the wake-up call will be uh, permanent, at least for God's remnant. I hope so, too. I hope it's a season where people feel that they're being set apart, not that they're being isolated that God has distanced us, us from the pablum that they've been spoon-fed based on whatever the agenda is of the denomination we seem to be uh, so enamored with. Uh, people who, who have been reluctant to change even though they know that the theology is flawed because they've been with the same Bible study group for 35 years. Well, they're not with that Bible study. They haven't been with that Bible study group for three months. And guess what? They're still alive and life went on. And I hope that this is the season where people will evaluate and say, you know what? 
I stayed there because of this group. Well, that group is not together anymore and may never be together again. What am I going to do when life returns to some freedom and some semblance? of? Will I go back to what it was or in this season of reflection? Have I used this as a gift from God to dive deeper into his word? to educate myself as to what the word really says, not what my pastor says it says, because he's only regurgitating the information given to him in seminary, who's only regurgitating to them whatever the denominational doctrine and theology is of whatever seminary they went to. They're only repeating what they've been told. And this is not a condemnation in any way. Uh, we've had this discussion before with seminary presidents, that a master's of divinity is one inch thick and miles wide and qualifies you to know a little bit about a lot of things. Right. Okay. Your doctorate gets you into that space where you can really focus in on what it is that you really believe and you really understand. But just going to seminary just means you're going to do it the way the seminary taught you to do it. Uh, if I hear one more time, Open your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, reading verses 17, 18, and 19. That's not to me a message. That's not to me life-changing and transformational. Turn with me to read Matthew chapter 5, the whole chapter. Now you've got my attention. Now, what was the context? What was Jesus saying? Who was he saying it to? Why was he saying it? Where was it written? He said, you heard it was written. Right? You, you heard that it was said. Okay. Where? What am I going back? Let's go back to why was it said and why was it written and what were they doing? And are, are you doing that? Well, this says don't do that. Are you exhibiting this behavior that Paul writes about to the church at Ephesus. If you're not exhibiting that behavior, does that really apply to you? Is that a standard doctrinal statement if you're not exhibiting that behavior? This is to be applied based on what was going on and reflecting on the context in which it was given to be able to give us the discernment to say, oh, that's just like what they were contending with. What did they do? What does Paul say we should do in this situation? How do we encourage and uplift and understand the scripture? You're not going to get that from the pulpit, and it's actually not the pastor's job. He was not hired to disciple everybody. He was not hired. He was hired to be the supervising physician over a, a group a flock, a family, a congregation, a patient base to diagnose each week what's ailing the body as a whole and to write a prescription on Sunday morning right, to address the symptoms of what ailments exist. His under-shepherds and his pastoral care people and his discipleship programs that he overseas. Those should all be made available. But we overburden the pastor with money issues and attendance issues and facility issues. And, you know, he's hired to preach the gospel. And 90% of the pastors that I know, the preachers that I know, their spiritual gift is preaching. It is not teaching. Uh, there are people who are spiritually gifted as teachers, and we need to put them in their just and right place and use those gifts for the betterment and uplifting of the whole body. We've been talking with Pamela Christian, author of Prepare for the Harvest. This is the fifth in the series, and this one is God's challenge to the church today. Just as the Bible uses the word today contextually to mean 5,000 years ago, it also means today this day. Uh, when we look at Deuteronomy 6, 5 and through 9, it says in these commandments I give you, this day are to be on your heart. It was that day and this day, today, that we are to be walking in this for each day is all we have. Tomorrow never comes. 
Yesterday is always gone. All we have is today. And this is God's challenge to the church today. We're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we're going to uh, wrap up with uh, uh, evaluating the culture and move into uh, looking at some of the realities, taking a look at some of the uh, opportunities for improvement. Uh, the chapter may be titled Failures and Follies, but I think opportunity for improvement where we can look at where the need is strongest to be able to answer the question. So now that we know the need is strongest, what, how should we respond where the need is strongest? And then take a look at the harvesting of souls and how we should all be about the Father's business. Our instructions were to go out and make disciples of men. It was the great commission, not the great omission. It does not stop with you. It starts with you. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. The Lord meets you right where you are, and so does Igniting Nation's new live streaming outlets. You can now watch Revealing the Truth, Revealing the Bible, and Prophecy Revealed simulcast live each Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Vimeo, Periscope, and through our website, www.ignitinganation.com. No matter what device you are using, our program will automatically scale so you won't have to miss a single program. And if you happen to miss an episode, you can always subscribe to the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel and access over 1,000 interviews and never miss your favorite authors, special guests, and topics that interest you the most. There are lots of ways to see Israel, but nothing compares to seeing the land of the book and the people of the book through the eyes of two Jewish believers who can take you on a journey that will bring the entire Bible to life. When you join Rabbi Eric Walker and his number one rated tour guide, Edo Canaan in Israel, you'll experience incredible teachings, first class accommodations, and actually walk where Jesus walked. You will experience the Bible transforming from black and white into living color, and you will never see the Bible in the same way again. For more information, visit us at www.ignitinganation.com forward slash events. The Lord contends with what contends with you, and Igniting a Nation is committed to bringing to light each and every issue that faces a believer's life. Our live stream programming and teachings take you on a journey to finding biblical truth from a wide variety of experts who share their insights into a deeper walk with the Lord. We have assembled the most comprehensive panel of experts in the fields of prophecy, caregiving, healing from trauma, shame, and abuse and so much more. We continue to expand our teachings and programming to meet your needs. We're committed to healing the nations with biblical truth. Visit www.ignitinganation.com to develop a deeper walk with the Lord and start your journey to a transformed life. The Bible commands us to study to show ourselves approved, but most study using Bible study tools and not actually studying the Bible chapter and verse. Igniting a Nation is pleased to present Revealing the Bible, recorded and taught each week before a live audience. We take you deeper into the actual Bible and verse in both Hebrew and English and connect the dots between the Old and New Testament. You can attend our two classes in Tuscaloosa and Birmingham or watch the program every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central Time on IgnitingAnation.com and all our other simulcast outlets. For more information, visit www.IgnitingAnation.com forward slash events. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. And we're talking with Pamela Christian, author of the new book, Prepare for the Harvest, God's Challenge to the Church Today. Pamela, welcome back. 
Thank you so much. You know, if you were to tune into the first half only, you might think that maybe we were doing a little bit of church bashing. Uh, that's not our intent whatsoever. Uh, it's a reality check. It is taking a, a real clear cleaning like I do my glasses 10 times a day. I clean my lenses so my vision is clear and taking a real assessment as to what effect and impact we have as the body and where we have room for improvement. And we cannot put that burden on every pastor who stands in the pulpit and say, you are responsible for everything that happens. That's just not fair, reasonable, and they are not Jesus. They are not God in the flesh. They are there to shepherd a flock and to do the best that they can and uh, not be overwhelmed and not be overburdened and not be tasked with every single thing. Therefore, they need the help. And there is a place for the church. And we need to find out what that place is and to find that. So in part two of your book, because you have it broken down into three parts. The first part is evaluating the culture, which I think all of us have to do. In any time we approach any theological subject, any condition, uh, you know, I just checked in to see what condition my condition was in. We need to do that on a regular basis. Now we need to evaluate. Right? Here's the needs of the people. Right? <clears throat> Would there be a need for the United Way? Would there be a need for goodwill? Would there be a need for these major national ministries or charities if the local church was doing what the church used to do a hundred years ago. We've changed, we've evolved, and the question comes into play, are we meeting the needs of the local? Have we gone to this mission mind that says we're going to go to Tanzania, uh, or we're going to go to Guatemala, or we're going to go to Honduras, those poor people we've got homeless problems at home. You've got homeless problems in your neighborhood. I'm the president of our homeowner association. I've got shut-ins who are not getting their needs met in my own neighborhood, and they're getting a letter from the association because their lawn's not maintained. Well, did anybody ever knock on the door and find out what the condition of the resident was? And the question is, no. Well, once I determined that, then I could put together a plan of action so that somebody would volunteer to go take care of their yard, volunteer to do a welfare check on this individual, get them engaged and get them more vibrant. Part of their infirmity may very well be the fact that nobody cares. That makes people sick. So are we first evaluating the church at home? Is that where it should begin? Not the building that houses the hundreds and the thousands, but should it be at home first? Our mom and dad, is dad the pastor of the house? Is he meeting the needs, the spiritual needs? Is he being the shepherd? He wanted a Proverbs 31 wife. Is he a Proverbs 31 husband? It's a big question. So how do we evaluate the church? There needs to be an internal church culture audit. It, it really needs to start with whether it's a leader, uh, a board run church or a pastor run church, whoever is the authority, however it's structured, they need to be willing to do a church culture audit and truly evaluate how they are operating. If, if there was 10 to 20 people who showed up on the church doorstep, do they have the right heart to receive the individuals who are coming to church very much different from the church culture. They will look different. They won't know the church manners and, and the church language. Uh, first off, do we have the heart of love that's going to receive these people who are very much, very different than ourselves? They may even smell because they've been living on the streets. Are we going to have the people with the right heart available to hug them, to welcome them, and help them with the quest that they are clearly on by just showing up at church. So the 
church culture audit really needs to be done in each and every church. And I'm pleased to say there are going to be some churches that will find that they rate really well, that they've got very few things that need to be corrected. But there are other churches that are uh, not Jesus-centric, that they are maybe pastor-centric or worship leader-centric. There, this is what the Lord is doing right now, in my opinion, with this time of the COVID-19 virus. He is shaking his church, and those things that can be shaken are being shaken. And this is a second chance. We, we could blow it, but I don't want us to. So I'm hoping and asking that uh, in the interviews like this, that people will find some merit in what I've written with this fifth book in the series and really do the tough stuff. It's not easy to evaluate our, ourselves. It's, it's, it's not easy to be that vulnerable, but it's necessary. And unless we realize our condition, we can't repent of it. And if we can't repent, we won't see any transformation. So it's essential that we take this time, what I'm calling a time of reset. God is giving the world, his people, a time of reset. And we need to, just like we do with our computer, go back, find out what is a good point and build from that. You know, it's interesting, as you're talking, I'm thinking about the fact that the Bible is very agricultural <clears throat> in so many ways because it was an agrarian society that uh, Israel and the nations were living in. And so God uses many of the natural illustrations to reveal supernatural truths. And I remember seeing the first, for the very first time, a machine that was used to harvest uh, pecans and uh, they used it to harvest other nuts is that it's a large machine it, it's got two jaws it goes around the trunk of the tree and then it shakes the whole tree and there's large nets for capturing and gathering all of this and uh, the shaking is what's going to bring the harvest okay mm -hmm. that's in the natural that's so we've developed equipment to keep people from having to climb up the trees now we shake the tree and the harvest comes. So this shaking that's going on is not a bad thing. And we need to reframe the whole view, our whole perspective of this, that the shaking that's going on is for the purpose of bringing the harvest, not for uprooting, not for tearing down, but for the harvest. Uh, quite important. So the third part of your book, as you begin to wrap up chapters 9 through 12, is about harvesting souls. Um, everybody's familiar with the passage in James that says, if you lack wisdom, ask for it. Do people really understand what that means? If you've ever played Monopoly and you've drawn a card that says, go directly to jail, do not pass go, do not collect $200, go directly to jail. That is what James is saying. He's not saying go to jail, go back to the beginning. Go back to what King Solomon said, that the beginning of wisdom is what? Fear of the Lord. James is not telling you that you go to the Lord and say, I want wisdom, and he just gives you a download of wisdom. He's saying, go back. If you don't have a reverent fear of the Lord, you are not a vessel worthy of containing wisdom. You are cracked, you are leaking, you need to go back and get on your knees and on your face and have a reverent fear of the Lord. So, you address that, of possessing a proper fear of the Lord not a popular topic and it's not one that most people really understand what James whose name wasn't James it was actually Jacob uh, but King James liked his name and he wanted a book uh, but uh, what do you mean by that possess a proper fear of the Lord you know that's a, a very difficult uh, concept to help people understand um, because I believe it's something that God gives us. I think to have a fear of God is a gift from God that he gives to those who belong to him. So people who will never choose Christ, who will never submit their heart to God, uh, won't understand a fear of the Lord. In fact, quite the opposite. They're at war with the Lord. 
Uh, what we are seeing playing out right now in our lifetimes is good versus evil. And what we as Christians need to understand is that Christ warned us. He gave us many, many warnings about the end times. And so are there prophets in the Old Testament who've done the same. Not to put us in a position of fear or a position of sequestering ourselves until the, the trouble is blown away. No, it's to forearm us. It's so that we will be able to withstand what's coming with the truth with the righteousness of Christ, with the victory that Christ died to give us. It's so that we will have the truth so convicted within us that no matter what we see, no matter what we encounter, our faith is stronger than what we see, and we're able to help other people who do belong to God come to faith in Jesus. This season right now, and I love the illustration of the harvesting of the pecans. That was a great visual, great word picture. That's exactly where we are, and it's Christ's people who already have discovered the truth, who are commissioned, as you re referenced earlier uh, from Matthew 28, to find the uh, those who will be receptive to Christ and to share the truth that we've been so blessed to find. The, if, if we were standing, using word pictures, if we were standing in a building and we knew that to our right was a whole group of people in the rooms that were on fire and we did nothing to help them, where is their love in that? Well, that's really what we're faced with today. We have people all throughout the world who are unaware of the fact that they are deceived, that they're actually living their life on the basis of lies, and they don't know it. And it's up to us, who have been commissioned by Christ, to share the truth we've been blessed to find. You know, Paul talks, and uh, I referenced it earlier in 2 Corinthians 5.17, all the way through 6.10, and really the 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 folks that that put chapters and verses together this is one they missed because there's one stream of consciousness that Paul starts in 2 Corinthians 5:17 goes all the way and ends with 2 Corinthians 6:10 and it's one frame and it says that anyone who's a messiah is a new creation the old is gone the new has come and you have been called into a ministry of reconciliations if God was reconciling himself to man through you and you have been called into an ambassadorship as if you were speaking the very words of God that even though you may be ill you you, you are made whole even though you are of uh, blasted criticized shamed you uh, you, you, you're in right standing with God. You are this new creation. It doesn't matter what they say about you. It's a matter of what he says about you. And this is a new identity. <clears throat> and if God is for you, who can be against you? And when you be, begin to understand he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And that if, if you're listening to the lies of the accuser, then you're listening to the wrong voice. And you have this new identity. But what will you do with it? Is it for your own gain? Right? Am I on television for my own gain? Do I ask people to send me money for a jet? Uh, we don't even ask for money on this program. We don't even ask for donations on this program. We don't sell sponsorships or advertising on this program. And we do three hours of live TV a day. Why? Because this isn't to glorify me. This is to edify the Lord and to share all the experiences that believers contend with. So what, what, what should we do with this embracing of our new identity that we haven't been doing? Well, I love what you're bringing out. It is an individual calling. It is not a collective calling with the pastor taking the lead. It is all of us together. And it is not the, the church within the four walls. It is the body of Christ in the world today. And each one of us. And I love what the Apostle Paul brings out that we each part needs the other part. The body needs each part. Not There's not one part that's greater or lesser than the other. So one of the things in my research that, um, and my experience also that I've discovered is that there's too much ego and too much competition in the Christian churches today. And again, this is a broad brush. But I recall whenever I was teaching for community Bible study that one of the responsibilities I had was to find a host church that would allow us and our children to use their facilities on a regular basis, which is a huge request. And we weren't in a position to be able to pay what that would really be worth. Uh, and in that experience, Rabbi, I found a lot of um, 
church leaders being uh, off put by our very existence, by the very existence of this Bible study. And I thought, how can we have too many Bible studies? And what I was getting introduced to was the competition and the defensive posture that many church leaders have today. And, and that goes back to some of the doctrinal issues that you brought up earlier. Um, but what I did find in my research that really gave me hope was a number of churches in South Florida who have band together under what they call Church United. What they did is they got together in humility as church leaders and identified the realities within their culture, their society, the ills of their society, how the elderly were being treated poorly, how there was such a drug problem, how the children in school were not being getting receiving the education that they needed, and, and also with the hunger issues. They got together and identified the true realities, the, the tragedies in their communities, and then they set, decided who has what skills to address what need, and collectively under this banner, Church United, these churches are doing fantastic things in the name of Jesus. Crime has gone down, drug problems have gone down. It, it is remarkable. And what the one woman I spoke to said, that brought it all together, she said, we got together and we decided we were gonna lay down our logos and our egos. And in doing that, we were able to work as one body. What a, what a great message. This is how you become a worker, worker of Harvest Revival as you wrap up this great book. We've got about uh, two minutes. So if you would, uh, I'd like you to speak directly to the audience to tell them how they can become workers of Harvest Revival. It's a matter of heart. It's not a matter of education. It's not a matter of a credential. It's not even a matter of how much Bible knowledge you have. It's a matter of passion of the heart. If you have found the reality of Jesus Christ and your life has been transformed because you've placed your faith in him, the most unloving thing you could do is not to share your faith. I'm sure you have people in your lives that don't, receive, that don't know Jesus. And the most unloving thing you can do is to not share your faith. Pray, find a way to connect with the individuals you love so much. Let, let the love of Christ be your guide and not any form of condemnation whatsoever, but the love of wanting them to have eternal life through faith in Jesus. It's a matter of the heart, and it's the most loving thing you can do to share the truth that you've been so blessed to find. Amen. Amen. Pamela Christian, author of Prepare for the Harvest, God's Challenge to the Church Today. Will you rise up to meet the challenge? Will you become a laborer in God's vineyard? Will you serve the true vine? My father is the vine dresser and I am the vine. Will you serve the vine? Will you be a part of God's harvest of souls? Will you be the one to pick us up the phone and calls? When church goes back in session and quarantine is lifted, when you back your car out of the driveway, will you take note of the neighbor's car that's in the driveway and stop and knock on their door and say, do you not have a church home to go to? I'd love to invite you to go with me. Do it in your neighborhood. It's the easiest place to see who's home on Sunday. Look in their driveway. If their car is still there, they're not going somewhere. It's easy to invite. It starts with you. That's where all change begins. Lord, let there be change, but let it begin with me. Pamela Christian. You can find more about her at PamelaChristianMinistries.com. If you want to get her book, go to IgnitedNation.com. Look at today's broadcast schedule. You're going to see a picture of this book. It's going to say the words. Love the interview. Get the book. Click on that link. It'll take you right to a link to get a copy of Prepare for the Harvest, God's Challenge to the Church Today. Pamela Christian, thank you for being a part of Revealing the Truth and sharing a great story with us. Thank you so very, very much for all you do. Thank you. God bless you. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth. <music>